Welcome to the Men's Health Network and Congressional Men's Health Caucus joint briefing on the mental health issues suffered by men and boys. My name is Anna Fadic and I'm the Vice President of Men's Health Network and we're a, no a national nonprofit organization striving to improve the health and well-being of men, boys and their families where they live, work, play and pray. We've spent many years working closely with the Bipartisan Congressional Men's Health Caucus and our co-chairs, Congressman Mark Wayne Mullen of Oklahoma and Congressman Donald Payne Jr. of New Jersey. In the packet you picked up at registration, you will have a one-pager about the Men's Health Caucus and ways that your boss can join the caucus. At some point during the day, we will have uh, Congressman Payne Jr. make some remarks, and Congressman Mullen has been invited as well. Um, hopefully he will be able to make it. So if we are in the middle of uh, speakers, then we'll take a pause and invite the Congressman to come say a few words. We also would like to quickly recognize a few of the supporting organizations in the audience today. We have members from the Veterans Health Council, the Dialogue on Men's Health, Healthy Start Association, uh, the organizers of the Eric Bothwell Awards, our friends from the Indian Health Service, Air Conditioning Contractors of America, the American Osteopathic Association, and the uh, folks from Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, the Cori. Today's briefing on the mental health of men and boys will delve into whether mental health problems like anxiety and depression, among others, are gateways to opioid and drug abuse in today's society. We strongly feel that more research is needed in this topic so we can find better solutions for the males in our society and policies that will help protect them. We have a full panel discussion today featuring key thought leaders, so we'll get started. A bit of housekeeping, we will have a uh, one minute for question and answer after each speaker, but we'll have a general question and answer session at the end, so make sure you write down your questions, remember them um, as they come up. So our first speaker, um, we have this up. So our first speaker is Dr. Eric Murphy, who is a program officer. Oh, okay. I believe we have a congressman that is coming to say a few words. Congressman Payne Jr. is on his way in. He has represented New Jersey's 10th Congressional District since November of 2012. He is the ranking member of the Committee on Homeland Security's Subcommittee on Emergency Preparedness, Response and Communications, and the House Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure. Congressman Payne Jr., would you like to say a few words? Good afternoon. How's everyone? Whole house here. Let me just um, welcome you to today's briefing on anxiety, depression, and opioid addiction among men and boys. Um, first, let me thank my co-chair of the Men's Health Caucus, Representative uh, Mark Wayne Mullen, and uh, the Men's Health Network for making today's event possible. So, uh, you know, we're really in the midst of um, an opioid addiction uh, crisis in this century. Uh, more than 42,000 people died from opioid overdose in 2016, according to the Centers for Disease Control. That's triple the number a decade ago. Our distinguished panel of experts is here to discuss the mental health issues, such as anxiety and depression, that can lead to an opioid addiction and drug use among men and boys. According to the Anxiety and Depression Association of America, Generalized anxiety disorder affects 6.8 million people, adults in the United States. Uh, major depressive disorder is the leading cause of disability in the United States for ages 15 to 44, and that affects another 16.1 million people. Uh, nearly one half you know, of people diagnosed with depression 
also are diagnosed with anxiety. They kind of go hand in hand. Uh, for men and boys, there is another factor that significantly harms their mental health and social, sti and social stigmas. Studies have shown that there is um, an underreporting of male mental health issues because society pressures men to be strong and to push through the pain. Too many, too many of our men and boys are suffering in silence because they're, they're embarrassed or because they fear that seeking mental health treatment will make them look weak. Let's finally end the stigma. Today is an important step in the right direction. Our panel is comprised of distinguished experts across the field of mental health and addiction. Join us today. Joining us today are Eric Murphy, the Program Chief of Depression and Suicide Related Behavior Program at the National Institute of Mental Health. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, Wisdom Powell, Director of Health Disparities Institute at the University of Connecticut. Dr. Gregory Tan, a specialist in child and adolescent psychiatry from Columbia University Medical Center. Um, and Nathaniel Counts, Senior Policy Director of Mental Health America. And Ann Fadich, 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 Fadich. Uh, Vice President of the Men's Health Network. I look forward to hearing uh, from today's experts on how we can develop solutions uh, to combat these mental health issues and the drug abuse in the United States. I also look forward to discussing ways Congress can assist in the care providers during these trying times. And, uh, you know, it's unfortunate that we find ourselves uh, with this crisis in the United States. Um, it is something that in the African American community, um, we have been trying to sound the alarm for two to three decades. But um, unfortunately now, the majority population finds itself uh, in this circumstance as well. And so now maybe we can come together as a nation and try to tackle this uh, dreaded issue. So thank you all for being here and um, weighing in on this uh, very important subject. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and the congressman gave some great introductions for our folks up here, so I think we're just going to get started, um, keeping in mind the time. So Dr. Eric Murphy, would you please come up? So I'm going to talk today about uh, translational research in developmental depression and suicide risk. And uh, as a federal employee, I just need to say that I have no disclosures or any conflicts of interest. And I'd also like to thank the organizers for inviting me. Next slide. All right. Uh, I figured I would start with giving a brief overview of my talk. I'll talk about what translational research is, just to give you a sense of what type of research I'll be describing, a little bit about brain development, both in healthy development as well as how that development may become disordered and lead to mental health issues. Uh, I'll give a few statistics about depression and suicide in youth and across the lifespan, uh, and a few snapshots of some ongoing research that NIMH has been funding and that we're really excited about. Uh, and then I may talk a little bit about uh, how this relates to some of the other issues that we are uh, talking about here today. Next. All right, so uh, in a nutshell, uh, the, the way translational research works uh, is nicely illustrated by the, the division structure at the NIMH. 
When you think of health research or, or really basic science research, you may think of people in white lab coats uh, sitting at benches and doing things with microscopes or pipettes or things like that. That's basic research, and that's really uh, the idea of understanding the basic relationships between molecules and, and genes and what all, all is going on, how that relates to behavior, health. Um, but in translational research, what we try to do is then use that information to understand how in humans we might be able to take that knowledge to inform our, our understanding of risk and resilience to things like mental illness, as well as uh, possible ways that we could uh, start thinking about treatments or preventions of those issues. And then finally, uh, the end of the research pipeline would be to start implementing those, those treatments or ideas in the broader public so that everybody can uh, make use of them. All right, uh, as a very, very brief uh, description of brain development, I can just tell you that brain development is extremely protracted. It goes on for probably much longer than you would expect. Uh, essentially, uh, what this picture is showing is that your, the rate of change of your brain is going on uh, from birth and it, it continues through age 20 and, and even beyond. Uh, and different areas of your brain develop at different rates and the cognitive skills that are associated with those different areas also develop at different rates. And the ones that you see, those little spots of green at the 20-year-old level, uh, those are the ones that are related to sort of cognitive control, uh, being able to, to control emotions and things like that, which as you may expect uh, is highly related with things like mental illness. Uh, and so disordered development really anywhere along this developmental trajectory can really have influences on downstream development that may lead to mental health issues. Uh, this is just a very brief picture of uh, development in adolescence, a really crucial time for mental health issues and, and when they t tend to develop. Uh, this picture basically describes uh, adolescence as a period when the regions of your brain that are responsible for uh, really primal drives, things like reward and fear and anger, those regions are developing a lot faster than the regions that are there to essentially control them, those frontal regions I pointed out. Um, and the area in gray in between those two areas is what they call the risky period, which is when you can both act in a risky way um, but also when you, when you are at risk of uh, disordered development really taking things in a bad direction. Uh, you can imagine that even if healthy development already shows this discrepancy between the drives that you have and the ability to control them, any deviation beyond these norms uh, could really lead to uh, consequences that may have serious mental health implications. Uh, things like impulsivity, negative affect, decreased response to reward. These are all things that are associated with various uh, mental health issues. And it's probably no surprise then that adolescence is the period of life that is most associated with the onset of mental health issues. So uh, what might be a contributor to disordered development of the brain? There are a ton of reasons uh, why disorder uh, development can go wrong. Uh, there are a number of environmental stressors that can uh, play a part. Things like trauma, malnutrition, neglect, abuse, poverty, uh, exposure to things in utero, either stressors, chemicals, all kinds of things. Uh, you can have a genetic predisposition towards disordered development, uh, either uh, a handful or a larger group of genes that may just make you more likely to develop uh, abnormally uh, towards uh, psychopathology. Uh, there's many other factors, including your social environment, uh, gender differences that uh, different uh, different genders can can be impacted by these things differently. The age at which some of these things happen to you uh, can have differential effects. Uh, where you are in your pubertal status, uh, with all these hormones going around and affecting things in your brain. 
And not only that, but all of these things have the potential to interact with each other. So uh, things that may be bad may jump onto other things that may be bad and have a multiplier effect. Or something good could cancel out something bad. Uh, so there's really a lot of things that can contribute to uh, the development of the brain, either healthy or not healthy. And uh, these are a lot of the things that we're really interested about uh, in translational research. Uh, and if you, okay, that's highlighted. So. Uh, I'm going to highlight a few studies later on that uh, deal with both the, some of these environmental stress issues as well as the social environment. Uh, but first, I want to just talk a little bit about some of the depression rates uh, and suicide rates in the country, just to give you a sense of what we're talking about here. Uh, and these will all be slides that are data directly from our website, and I'll have a link to that at the end of this talk. Um, as you can see, these are the ages of adolescence, so just between 12 and 17. And you can see in those dark blue bars, there's just a huge increase in the rate of depression uh, over that time, from 5% to a 17, 17.4%. So really, I mean, it, when I say adolescence is a, is a key time for the development of mental health issues, you're seeing it right there. And in fact, when we look at adults now in the dark blue bars, what we can see is that young adulthood is the highest rate of depression, uh, and then it starts going down in middle and later age. Now, when we start looking at suicide, uh, this is a, this is a gr uh, chart of the leading causes of death. So this is just number of deaths uh, and, and ranked. Uh, by these different age bins. And what you can see is that it looks at first like a very similar pattern, right? The, it, it peaks around adolescence and early adulthood and then starts to drop off uh, in, in later age. But in fact, when we look at the actual rates broken down by age and by gender, uh, you can see that for males on the right, it's actually almost a linear increase across the lifespan uh, where the, the uh, suicide rates just keep going up as you get older. And even for females, these rates increase uh, through middle age and then start to decrease uh, with older age. Uh, I, I really point this out to show that depression and suicide, while they're clearly related to each other, are different things and they, they need to be thought of separately and, and can't just be lumped together necessarily. All right, so just a couple of studies uh, that we're funding that really address these issues nicely and, and take a really interesting look at these. Uh, this study is called Psychobiological Mechanisms Underlying the Association Between Early Life Stress and Depression Across Adolescence. And early life stress is, uh, is just what it sounds like. It's encountering some of these stressful life events early in life, usually preschool age or earlier. Um, and we've known for a while that if you've experienced early life stress, you're at higher risk for later psychopathology. Um, but it's still not entirely clear why this is. When do you have to experience this stress? What kind of stress leads to what kind of outcomes? Um, and so we're really not clear on what's going on there. And so this study is attempting to parse some of those things out by uh, collecting a large group of kids uh, starting around nine years old and just collecting as much information as they can about these individual experiences of early life stress, um, you know, very detailed, what types of stressors did they experience, when, uh, how did they feel about it, and then just follow these kids over the years and do repeated assessments on them to see how their behavior was. Did they did several brain scans on these kids to see how their brain changes? Uh, how did their depression severity scales rate uh, as, they, as some of them tend to develop depression in, in these ages? Uh, it, it will separately look at different parts of depression, just like it looks at different ways that you can experience early life stress to really tease apart what leads to what, what contributes to problems where. Um, and this is a really, uh, novel study that, that is hopefully going to uh, really start cracking some of these nuts that we've been having trouble with. Another study that I'd like to highlight uh, is biomarkers, social and affective predictors of suicidal thoughts and behaviors in adolescents. And this study looks at a, another phenomenon that we've known about for a while but you know haven't, haven't been able to get into too deeply, which is that Individuals who have been hospitalized for suicidal thoughts and behaviors 
are highly likely to make a suicide attempt within six months of discharge. Once you've, once you've been at a level where you've been hospitalized, you're now at a very high risk for fairly short-term uh, recurrence of, of these thoughts and behaviors. Uh, and so they are interested in the family context that individuals are being discharged into to understand whether stressful environments may be particularly uh, conducive to or, or maladaptive to, to fixing these uh, suicidal thoughts and behaviors. And they're also going to look at whether early maltreatment may exacerbate um, the effect to which one's environment uh, contributes to their uh, either recovery or worsening situation. All right, I'm going to skip this slide in the area of, in the interest of time and just show one quick map um, that I thought was very interesting. This is showing uh, the rates of suicide across the United States on the left and the rates of opioid prescriptions uh, by county on the right. And I just wanted to point out the similarities in the overall structure of these maps and how you can see a lot of regional similarities and overlap between these two factors. I'm not suggesting that one leads to another, but rather that there may be a lot of similar underlying causes that may be contributing both to suicidality and suicide thoughts as well as to, um, to opioids and drug use issues that we're talking about today. Uh, here is a link to some references uh, from what I talked about, and I'd like to thank you for your time. Okay. We will, um, does anybody have a quick question for Dr. Murphy? Yes. Is it possible to get a link to your slides? We can, we can see if we can do that. Okay, uh, our next speaker is Dr. Wisdom Powell, uh, who is the Director of Health Disparities Institute and Associate Professor of Psychiatry at the University of Connecticut. Uh, she was appointed by President uh, Obama to serve as a White House Fellow to Secretary of Defense in 2011 to 2012, and in this role she provided subject matter expertise on military mental health, like PTSD, suicide, and military sexual trauma. Dr. Powell? Good afternoon, I think. <laughs> so I'm here today in my capacity both as a psychologist, um, as a daughter, as a granddaughter, as an auntie of boys um, and men who I love dearly, and also as the chair of the American Psychological Association's working group on health disparities in boys and men. And today I'm going to talk a little bit about the context surrounding the issues that we're talking about today. Next slide. Before going forward, I think it's um, important to acknowledge the other members of the APA Working Group on Health Disparities in Boys and Men. This is an interdisciplinary group of scholars, experts from across the country who have come together all um, to collaborate on solutions both for policymakers, for clinicians and practitioners, and also for scientists. Next slide. So I want to start this conversation out with a warning that was offered by Chimamanda Adichie, who warns us of the dangers of a single story. And she talks about single stories as being dangerous because they tell incomplete and isolated truths, that they flatten lived experience, and that they emphasize the stereotypes. And why start with this warning? Well, one of the reasons it's important to start here is because I believe that we've been having a fairly narrow discussion across the country about boys and men. Next slide. Even as a woman who believes uh, wholeheartedly in gender equality and equity and the advancement of women and girls, it is really hard to look at the growing public discourse around boys and men that both problematizes them and pathologizes them, and at the same time renders their interior lives relatively invisible. The truth is that boys and men in our nation are in a crisis, but this crisis is unfolding amidst a widening empathy gap. Next slide. All around us is compelling epidemiologic evidence suggesting the need to disrupt these single stories 
Compelling evidence, for example, suggests that despite having more social power than women, men in the US are more likely to experience premature death from conditions amenable to early detection. And so the whole story that needs to be told is one that indicates that over the past three decades, we've only made modest progress in reducing sex differences in key health outcomes. Next slide. Supporting the need even further for a more holistic story is the frequently discussed paradox in mental health. That is, while men tend to report less depression than women and to be diagnosed with depression at, at lower rates, they also have higher rates of suicide completion. Next slide. A whole story about boys and men would, would state that while it is true that women are at higher risk for opioid addiction, it is also well known that many more men in the U.S. perish prematurely from overdose deaths, deaths including deaths from opioids. Next slide. What was curious to us at the working group is that largely absent from our stories about boys and men is that at the very early stages of life, boys are more negatively affected by early environmental stress, both inside and outside the womb, and that, as research suggests, girls have more built-in mechanisms that foster a kind of resiliency against stress. Even when we look at the lower PTSD rates that we see among men relative to women, men are more fre frequently exposed to traumatic events. And the highest rates of opioid use disorders among individuals reporting traumatic events and exposure uh, and uh, with a correlation with PTSD happen among men. But even if our hearts and minds aren't moved by the call to tell wholer stories about boys and men, perhaps evidence about the economic cost might compel action. The World Economic Forum describes hidden costs of diseases and suggests that mental health disparities like the ones we're observing among boys and men in the US increase healthcare spending, depletes human capital, diminishes worker productivity, and impacts our economic growth and aggregate outputs. Next slide. And there has been ample research suggesting that mental health problems also impact labor force participation. On this slide is a graph showing uh, data that suggests that over the past six decades, there's been a slow decline in the labor force partici participation rate of men, especially those between the ages of 25 and 54. Next slide. But alongside this evidence, we have some compelling new data that suggests that nearly half of the working men not in the labor force report daily opioid use. So why might we be seeing these consequences? Well, we know some things about health disparities in boys and men from psychological and social epidemiologic research. The first is that males have a more difficult time labeling and detecting emotions. Very early in the life course and very early in the socialization process, boys are not uh, taught to identify and distinguish between anger and shame. Males are also reluctant to disclose physical and mental health problems. And we know from compelling national evidence that males delay health screenings and wait longer to seek acute medical and mental health attention. But boys and men are not hardwired biologically to delay mental health signs and symptoms. In fact, we know that a large part of what we're observing are, are in their behaviors are socially determined. And even with all of the attention that we've paid to mental health disparities in boys and men, there's still a missing piece of the puzzle. Next slide. And that missing piece of the puzzle is the limited focus on the role played by an equitable distribution of power, opportunity, and social determinants that uniquely compromise the mental health of socially disadvantaged boys and men. So we started this journey, next slide, with reframing, this is fine, mental health disparities in boys and men. And we made some key assumptions that I think are relevant to our conversation today. The first is that the risk for health disparities form in childhood and continue as boys and men age, as we heard from our first presenter. And that while genetics and individual health behaviors are important, 
Disparities in mental health are primarily, primarily determined by social conditions in which boys live, work, play, grow, get educated, and get health care. Next slide. We also reframed this focus on mental health disparities and other health disparities in boys and men to, to zero in on stress. And we see stress as a fundamental or root cause of mental health disparities and physical health disparities among boys and men. And we suggest in our report that stress uh, affects the mental health of boys and men directly through physiological pathways and indirectly through health behaviors and decisions. Next slide. It was also important for us to view these issues through a gendered lens. And what do I mean by that? Well, we talked a little bit this morning about the pressures that boys and men are under to be a man about their issues, to respond to stressors in ways that display physical and mental toughness. On every playground across this country, we can find a mother, father, or a social mother, a father, saying to a young boy, walk it off after he falls down on the playground. These messages like boys don't cry, take it like a man, have an enduring effect on men's capacity to disclose vulnerability. And we know from emerging evidence that men who adhere rigidly to these definitions of masculinity also report more substance abuse. Next slide. But I think that even as we talk about masculinity, it's important to realize that masculinities are multidimensional, plural, and situational. So as we're talking about substance use and mental health as a consequence of toxic masculinity, I think it's important to recognize that masculinities refer to what men and boys do moment to moment and, in situation, and from situation to situation. It's not rooted in biology or personality characteristics. These are social constructions that we all are complicit in maintaining. We recognized in our uh, working group that as we're talking about masculinities, gender, and mental health, that we are observing pronounced disparities among boys and men who have not had full and equitable access to opportunities for securing socioeconomic power and stability. And that's even in contrast to other males in the United States. Next slide. So we focused in our report on these groups of socially disadvantaged boys and men, particularly paying attention to racial and ethnic minority men and, and men who have sexual minority status. Next slide. Why focus on racial and ethnic minority males at a time when the, it seems that we need to be talking about all boys and men? Well, there is compelling evidence to suggest that our suicide rates are consistently higher among American Indians and Alaska Natives, particularly because this group faces unique stress and trauma associated with um, uh, their place in society. Next slide. We are also seeing recent increases in suicide rates among five to 11 year old black boys. And this is despite you know, years of black boys having lower um, suicide rates in our country, some of the lowest. And even at a time when we see the rates of suicides decreasing in non-Hispanic white males. <clears throat> Next slide. An even more compelling reason to talk about this in the context of the opioid crisis is be because the steepest escalations in drug overdose deaths have occurred particularly among non-Hispanic blacks between the ages of 45 and 64, and yet the dominant discourse has done very little to include this population. From 2012 to 2015, for example, cocaine overdose deaths were almost as common in black men as prescription opioid deaths in white men. Next slide. We also know that sexual minority boys and men are at heightened risk for bullying and harassment, and they are more likely to experience mental health problems and to be at risk for substance abuse and dependence when compared to their heterosexual counterparts. Sexual minority men and boys are also victims of hate crimes that can increase their risk for substance use and abuse. And so we make some recommendations in the report, next slide, that we think might help to counterbalance these issues. 
The first recommendation is that we leverage policy opportunities to expand programs that can assist boys and men's, men who are returning or re-entering communities from prisons and jails. This includes providing masculinity and trauma-informed care and services while men are incarcerated and after they are released. We need to harness every policy opportunity we have at our disposal to expand behavioral health care access and coverage for boys and men. After Medicaid expansion, we witnessed an uptick in insurance um, coverage among childless men which re represented it for our nation the first time that we've been ever able to expand coverage to this population. We need to redress child welfare, pro welfare programs to support father involvement in the socio-emotional development, not just the financial uh, contributions um, among their non-residential ch uh, children. Next slide. We need to begin providing training to psychologists and healthcare professionals and providers working with socially disadvantaged populations, to incorporate comprehensive assessments for mental health screening and primary care. We need to flip the, clin the clinic so that we're providing opportunities for men to seek care at, at non-traditional hours like on nights and weekends. And we need, most importantly, to provide implicit bias and trauma detection training for every person that touches the lives of a boy or a young man developing. I just want to leave you with some just final thoughts because I'm at time. Because I think I started with the single story, so it's important to end one. I um, am the granddaughter of a Korean War veteran who died prematurely at the age of 53 from a preventable cancer that was linked to substance abuse and addiction. And when he died, so did a part of my family history and so many opportunities for intergenerational le learning were, were also diminished. And so I know firsthand what it looks like to be on the receiving end of the premature loss of a boy or man that could have been saved or helped um, by st social structures and programs and policies. And so I think we have an opportunity now and, a, and the knowledge to disrupt these single stories and to do what we would want anyone to do for the children, the men, um, in our lives that we love and care about. Thank you. Are there any quick questions for Dr. Powell? Yes. Uh, I'm Andrew Sanderson. I'm the medical officer for the Office of Minority Health. Uh, you talked about the increases in suicides for, um, for uh, black males from the ages of 5 to 11. We know that adverse childhood events um, can lead to uh, more uh, disease in later in life. The other speaker talked about early, um, early childhood stress or early life stress. Is there an age at intervention or screening or assessment that the uh, APA recognizes would be um, beneficial for, uh, for, adult, for children uh, to try to prevent this or to, um, to identify her? That's an excellent question. I can't say with specificity we've pinpointed an exact age, but I can say that we have been advocating for earlier um, interventions um, for young, for boys and men and for other children who may be at risk. And I think that whatever we design, it has to be designed with a life course developmental lens applied. We know that there are specific brain maturation, identity development issues that happen at different stages of, of the life course of, of our youth. And I think that if we were to develop strategies, they have to be aligned with what we know about development. It's often been the case that we have policies on this side and life course developmental specialists sit sitting on this side, and, and they rarely ever talk to one another. So I think at the very best, if we were to, to bring more developmentalists to the table as we're thinking about policy solutions, and really start to tailor, tailor our interventions to be more life stage, life, life course appropriate, I think we would have better outcomes. Oh, and my talk's gonna be about that. So okay. It's okay. Good. <laughs> so, more to come. Yes. All right, our next speaker is Dr. Gregory Tao, who is board certified in child and adolescent psychiatry, general psychiatry, and addiction medicine. As faculty at Columbia University, Dr. Tao conducts MRI research that aims to understand how the brain's neural systems function in individuals who abuse substances. He is involved with community groups in order to reduce the burden of drugs and alcohol on the lives of young people.
Thank you very much for having me here. Um, I really appreciate it. It's, it's quite an honor. So um, today I'm going to put my hat on as a clinician, as someone who sits in my office and sees a lot of teenagers in uh, New York City. And um, I'm going to take a step back and um, we'll look at the overall uh, prevalence of, um, sorry, I'm just going to click on this. There we go. Uh, next slide. Um, overall prevalence of substance use by youth in our country and the ways that it's linked to other mental health condition. And a really key message that um, I'd like to communicate is that substance use disorders don't travel alone. And dually diagnosed individuals or those with substance use and a co-occurring or comorbid uh, psychiatric condition, um, such as mood, anxiety and psychotic disorders um, are are more prevalent than we think. This is more the rule than the exception in clinical population. And for this reason, we can't turn a blind eye to substance use in mentally in individuals and to other mental health conditions in substance-involved youth, as is uh, often the case. Um, next slide. So. Um, this is the latest data from the Monitoring the Future study, uh, which is a, a longitudinal study that's been going on for over 40 years um, at the University of Michigan that queries 8th, 10th, and 12th graders, as well as college students, and asks them about their substance use. You can see that the lifetime pre prevalence of any substance use by youth is quite high, and uh, it's around 50% for um, high school seniors, not surprisingly. I'm going to focus on three, uh, oh, sorry, four substances, uh, the two most prevalent ones, marijuana and alcohol, and opioids as well, because we do have a crisis, and, um, and e-cigarettes, because I've been seeing a lot more of this in my practice, and I just want to say a few words on this. I think it's quite important. Um, so let's have... Uh, Let's see, I think um, we skipped a slide. Uh, can you take one step back? Oh, there we go, thank you. Um, so these are the most recent statistics uh, for marijuana use in youth in our country. And you can see that the, in 2017, we see the first significant annual increase in seven years um, across grades. Uh, so the researchers look at this data and they look to see if there's any changes from one year to the next across this cohort, across this population, that uh, is statistically significant. They found that this year is the first time that there's an uptick. Um, and the thought is that it has to do a lot to do, uh, next slide, with the perception of harm. We know historically that perception of harm um, is inversely proportional to the use. So if we don't think something is a big deal and we're not concerned about it, the barriers to use are going to be um, lower. And uh, we believe that these days the messaging around marijuana use is such that it supports these ideas of reduced harm and it's linked to increased use. Um, next slide. Um, thank you we see that um, marijuana use doesn't discrimin uh, discriminate across um, socioeconomic conditions, uh, uh, classes on the lower right, and on the le lower left uh, across uh, races. However, there is a disparity between, or a difference between uh, boys and girls in daily marijuana use. So daily or near daily use of marijuana in, in boys is 8% and girls is 3.6. So it's over uh, two times more prevalent in boys, which is an important, uh, important thing to note. Um, on the next slide, we see uh, some data from Monitoring the Future on alcohol use by youth. And we can see that uh, the rates 
uh, in both males and females have declined dramatically over the years. Over the years, in 2017, relative to 2016, there's a bit of a plateau. So this uh, rapid decline is um, has halted. It's a little bit of a plateau, and uh, the rates of uh, boys drinking uh, was historically much higher than girls, and the gap is closing now. In the next slide, I want to talk a little bit about vaping. Uh, I think we all walk around and see people in the streets using very large Baroque devices that uh, emit steam and smoke. And uh, over the years, these have gotten quite smaller. Um, and now, uh, something very popular that I see high school students using um, in school, outside of school, um, in class, in my office, like this, um, are these little nicotine vapes. Uh, this one you might be familiar with. It's called the Juul, J-U-U-L. And uh, it's very tiny. It's just this little thing that it's USB rechargeable. and. You just plug it into the iPhone charger or your computer, and um, they come with these pods, and each pod is equivalent to a pack of cigarettes. And um, uh, just kind of backing up, vaping is defined as a use of any electronic vaporizer device to inhale nicotine products, to uh, ca cannabis products, or mar marijuana products, um, or flavoring. There are people who uh, just vape flavoring, and uh, some of the tobacco products are flavored as well. I mean, there's creme brulee and bubble gum, and, I think the latest um, craze is over the pineapple flavor. Um, and um, in the past year, 19% uh, of 12th graders have tried uh, a nicotine vaporizer, uh, and 16% of 10th grader, and 8% of 8th graders, which is quite high. Uh, it's something that I see a lot in individuals who would have never considered smoking cigarettes before. Vaping is very addictive. Vaping. Um, increases the likelihood of subsequent cigarette use. So it's almost like an introduction to cigarettes. It's an easy transition because it's nicotine as well. And it also, more vaping. Uh, because the normal feedback mechanisms uh, around vaping uh, relative to cigarettes are not there. Uh, people stop after a few uh, inhalations of a cigarette, a puff of a cigarette, or after one or so. Uh, with vaping, there's, you don't get that same kind of feedback the cough and all that, so people consume a lot more nicotine, so it's easier to get dependent. Um, male gender and marijuana use are associated with e-cigarette use in youth, and um, though vaping may be a harm reduction strategy um, or a smoking secession strategy, because it's not, we don't know that it, it, it to be linked to lung cancer and a lot of the very negative health outcomes um, in, uh, from smoking cigarettes. It can be a gateway to other nicotine use by many teens, and it's associated with concurrent and subsequent cigarette smoking. Um, the good news is that cigarette smoking is uh, viewed as very harmful by youth, and the rates continue to decline in 2017 to really historic lows. I'm going to just say something really quick about opioids. Um, in this study and in some other uh, national studies, we, it's hard to see an overall increase in the rates of use or reported use by, o opioid use by youth. And it may be that um, adolescents are affected uh, because of uh, the effects of opioid use on their, their families and in their communities. Um, and it's something that's just not borne out by these studies. Um, that said, I see a lot of opiate using adolescents in my practice, and a huge uh, problem is access to care, uh, because a lot of the because medication assisted treat, treatment for opiate use is um, uh, it's really a li quite a lifesaver, and it's not often available and researched uh, and approved for adolescent use. So that's something that's a, a very important thing to focus on. Um, I put the next slide up there uh, just to show you that if we look at, have you ever used any kind of drug or even had a sip of alcohol at any point in time to have you used in the past 30 days or in the past week, th these rates go down. And uh, you know, because <coughs> many people have tried drugs, but far fewer people use frequently 
and get into trouble with it. And how, do, how can we tell that someone has a problem? How do we, what do we, what criteria do we use to diagnose? Um, in the DSM-5, which is the Diagnostic Statistic Manual published by the American Psychiatric Association, um, there are a few areas, a few domains that we look at or we um, analyze in when someone comes into our, our office to figure out if they have a problem. One area is the loss of control over use. Um, the substance is taken in larger amounts or over a longer period of time than intended. There's always a persistent desire to quit or unsuccessful attempts to cut down or control the use and continued use despite having persistent and recurring, recurrent social or interpersonal problems caused by or exacerbated by the substance. Um, the other day, um, one of my patients uh, came into the office and she said that she has, she's keeping the jewel pods and her boyfriend keeps the jewel uh, just so they don't use. And then when they get, get together, they smoke over the weekend. The, the lengths they, they go to to regulate this use. Um, I noticed that I'm running out of time, and I want to just say a few words about comorbidity. Um, many people use over their lifetime. Fewer people have problem substance use. And then individuals with other psychiatric conditions, uh, there's a big overlap, a very big overlap between uh, mental health illness uh, and uh, problem substance use. Um, it's possible that there are shared risks for psychiatric illness and substance use. There may be overlapping symptoms, which makes it very difficult to diagnose and treat. And in fact, in the presence of significant substance use, it's very difficult to make another mental health diagnosis just because substance use problems are great masqueraders. Substance use, uh, problem substance use predisposes <laughs> to psychiatric illness and vice versa. We also know that individuals who use substances get into Make, make the treatment of other mental health conditions quite complicated. Substance uh, use disorders affect the course of psychiatric illness the and vice versa. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of recidivism in this population. Um, and uh, how many minutes do I have? Okay, so um, we'll, uh, if, if uh, the organizers will make this presentation available to you. You can review uh, some information about disruptive behavior disorders, such as ADHD, oppositional defined disorder, conduct disorder, what they're about, how they're associated with substance use problems, mood disorders such as depression, bipolar disorder, and how they're associated with substance use problems, and some anxiety disorders, such as generalized anxiety disorder, social anxiety disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, and post-traumatic stress disorder, which we've heard about earlier, and the relationships between those and substances, as well as some psychotic disorders. And one thing that I know, we all know about the data, where heavy marijuana use predisposes to uh, uh, youth having a psychotic episode. So in wrapping it up, what can we do about it? It's very important to increase the funding for education, to address knowledge, the stigma, prevention, screening, treatment, and research. I'm so delighted CHIP is funded. It's on its way. Uh, we also have in the works the 20th century, 21st Century Cures, or the STOP Act, which secures funding for SBIRT, or Screening, Brief Intervention, and Referral to Treatment, which is an evidence-based strategy to identify youth at risk and get them the help they need. There's also a Youth Act in the House, uh, which extends uh, MAT, or Medication-Assisted Treatment for Opiate Use, to minors, which is uh, critical. And at the end, you can see a way to contact me should you have any additional questions. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, and last but not least, we have Nathaniel Counts, who is the Senior Director of Policy at Mental Health America. His work involves innovative federal and state policy solutions for problems in behavioral health. He focuses on issues in alignment and sustainable financing in behavioral health care, as well as issues in population health. Thanks. Um, and how do I change this guy right here?
Hi, everyone. Um, so, is this one more? Can, okay, if everyone can kind of hear me. Uh, so I was tasked to kind of wrap this up and bring it home for policy, and I think I got extremely lucky. I think this will cover sort of everyone, even though uh, we only had one planning call. Um, so I'm very excited. Um, and so you can see our sort of motto at uh, Mental Health America is before stage four. Um, so for example, you know, like naloxone purchasing to stop overdose deaths are important, but there is a million points along that pathway that we could have intervened, and we should definitely take quite a lot of them. Um, so throughout this, throughout actually all the presentations, and this is where I really got lucky, everyone sort of noted the different way that like a, an event at time point A affects time point B, and how there's all these different points of intervention, and you even asked a question on this. Um, so there's an entire field called developmental cascades, where you can not only have this sort of like lay model, like difficult child factors and uh, this sort of uh, socio-cultural context leads to early parenting problems, leads to you know, all these sort of things we can interpret, you'll see next to it are little numbers, and that is the effect size that each thing has on the next thing. So we can actually tell how important every step is along the way. Um, the other interesting thing is you can do this by gender. So how does gender affect this? And how does race affect this? And how does your community affect this? Um, and the answer is it's different every single time. Like, some factor might matter more for men than others, and some factor might matter more for women. Um, and you can and should take this into account when designing interventions, especially uh, when deciding what to finance through policy. Um, and so that was just the one for birth to substance use in adolescence. Um, I could have printed out or put up more of them, but they started to look like those little pictures where you like hold it close to your face and kind of bring it away slowly. Um, so I just did it with one. But what do they look like? They look pretty similar. Um, a series of events that are sort of similar to the ones you just saw lead to depression, lead to suicide. Then, interestingly enough, they all, as been pointed out earlier, lead to one another if you keep going across the life course. So if you start using substances in adolescent, um, men in particular are actually way more likely to get depressed in older age. Um, and very likely it's like somewhat bi-directional, like they're affecting one another directly, but there's probably also underlying factors um, relating all of them to each other. Okay, so what does all this mean for policy, right? Because that's totally the important part, uh, since you guys all are here on the Hill. Um, so all the clinical stuff, for example, is exciting, but you don't need to mandate, right, that boys recognize their emotions better. Um, what we need is to make sure that we're financing interventions that are effective, that you pay people who help boys recognize their emotions to show up and do so. Um, and so I was going to go through, I think, five good policy areas that we can improve upon to make sure we're doing gender responsive and effective intervention. Um, so the first one is McV, which you might recognize from the battle to try to reauthorize it, along with CHIP and community health centers. Um, that's the home visiting programs. Uh, so if you know, like, nurse family heart partnership, all these things that help <coughs> new low-income moms um, raise newborn babies. And so if you'll remember, a lot of this cascade starts at, like, very, I mean, even, like, preconception, but through conception into birth. Um, and so home visiting gives you a chance to begin to disrupt some of the cascade um, and intervene to support parents uh, as they go along. But, I mean, so make, funding McV in and of itself is important, but we have tested McV so much, like there's mountains of evidence supporting it. At some point, it just needs to become part of healthcare, right? Like we don't need to grant fund it, it could just be paid for by Medicaid, and the same McV funds could then be used to push us on to the next frontiers of home visiting. Because um, home visiting was tested in the early 90s, and I think we're ready for whatever the next thing is. Um, and I think the extent funding is liberated to help community-based organizations figure out how we can do even better jobs. That would be a huge um, <coughs> help to boys and men. Um, so we have Every Student Succeeds Act. So um, let's say we have the hospitalized adolescent uh, who had suicidal ideation. Where do they go next? They go back to school. Um, and we have an entire mountain of new especially through Every Student Succeeds Act, ways that schools can kind of intervene to help kids um, from all sorts of stuff with professional development, new use of funds for how we train teachers, and opportunities in measuring sort of uh, school progress and ways to partner with the community. Um, schools unquestionably need help. Uh, and so in healthcare, for example, we use these things called quality improvement organizations where you have sort of central conveners helping clinicians meet their quality improvement objectives. We have no such thing in education. I mean, there's some like centralized TA centers, but nothing that's really helping them figure out what works in mental health and substance use. It's more like everyone reinventing the wheel over and over again all over the country. Um, 
And so the, you might recognize this from uh, Chip as part of what just was reauthorized, thank God. And um, CMMI creates opportunities for new payment models in healthcare. So if you want clinicians to practice in any way different than they were currently practicing, CMMI creates a pathway, which is the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, um, to liberate them to do so and try realigning incentives to get them to do things like intervene way earlier than they have been. Um, and CHIPRA is the re last reauthorization of CHIP that created the uh, quality measurement standards for pediatrics, um, or at least the innovation pilots. Like, there's no standardized measure set, but there is uh, new measures being developed that are helpful. Um, so the biggest two barriers in the way we pay for healthcare uh, services for children in this area is we only pay for services when a condition's identified. So even though we know with like some degree of predictive certainty that these factors are likely to cause later substance use, depression, suicide, we cannot do anything until we have a code like they are now diagnosable with depression or they have suicidal ideation, um, unless we fudge it through adjustment disorder or something. Um, but we don't want to like force doctors to fudge their things, we want to make sure we're supporting good practice. Um, and the last thing I think is making sure that we sort of weight and value the earlier intervention. I mean, every intervention at every point in the life course isn't the same amount effective and if to the extent there's like a really critical period of time to intervene, I think we would want to make sure that value-based <coughs> payment um, really does reinforce that kind of intervention. And so I just, I just kind of blew through those but because you've had a long day of uh, different science, but the point is um, there's good evidence to show like depending on how you intervene at different points in the pathway, um, it has different amounts of effectiveness and all of you in this room have sort of different parts of the levers of power that would cause that kind of intervention. Um, so thank you so much. All right, great. So we will be taking um, questions and answers. I did get a note that if you provided us with your email address at the front and when you signed in that we will see what we can do about getting the slides over to you. So if you would like those slides, please leave your email address. Um, we'll open the floor up for questions to any of our panelists. student drinking. Um, in 1985, around about 1985, was the federally encouraged change in drinking age. And since that time, we've seen significant increases in binge drinking on college campuses. And while it's leveled off, we're now seeing more marijuana use. And so I'm, I don't want to do a correlation causation error, but I am curious about your, um, your, your thoughts on college age drinking, drinking age, etc. That's a very good question. I don't have the data that uh, might uh, correlate perhaps an increase in marijuana use versus decrease in drinking. Uh, you know, we do see that relationship in the data that I showed from uh, the monitoring the future. I'm not sure that there's necessarily a relationship because there's so many other factors uh, that have to do with perhaps some cultural shifts. Um, I know that um, the uh, norms in my uh, population of high school students and college students are profoundly distorted uh, relative to what the NIAAA definition of a binge. Um, there, um, <laughs> you know, there, there are uh, uh, culturally, ac you know, acceptable um, college behaviors around drinking and smoking. Um, there is in decreased tolerance for uh, these types of behaviors within fraternities, dorms, uh, generally on campus, which with much higher, uh, greater punishment, I don't see that leading to behavior change in my patients. I just see them getting into more trouble. Um, and I, you know, I, this is this is not. I'm not blaming universities, uh, but the uh, e the mental health interventions that they provide are anything but robust. And um, because of various disclosure rules, uh, it's very difficult to get parent involvement and support for college students who are essentially function as children. And uh, you know, the likelihood is that they have 
unaddressed comorbid conditions, and they simply can't navigate the system uh, without without help. So it's it's a tough landscape. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Tom Berger from the uh, Veterans Health Council. I'm a recovering academic, and I used to <laughs> study high-risk behaviors. Been talking about a number of things. Are there any? What's the impact? Of what you've been talking about nowadays on teen pregnancy? I guess from a developmental perspective, um, someone actually at uh, RTI came up with a measure that can predict one year later not only your likelihood of initiating substance use, but actually your initiation of um, high risk sexual behaviors, wearing a seatbelt, um, unintentional uh, injury. So I think there's like, you know, sort of profound interrelated developmental correlates that uh, common interventions like the ones we've discussed today could uh, impact. <laughs> could be, could be. Other questions? I did work, do some work with RTI a long time ago. Yes. Um, I have a question for Dr. Paul. So going back onto your slide that says focus on racial and ethnic minority males, have you focused on Native Hawaiians? Just because you did say that higher suicide rates are amongst American Indians and Alaska Natives, and they have Culturally, they have similar backgrounds, especially with depression. So what do you think of that? And do you have data on that as well? So my, um, in my scientific area of expertise, I haven't uh, focused in specifically on that population, but there are striking similarities um, with respect to the kinds of racialized trauma, historical trauma exposures that are, we see in African American males um, that we might see in more indigenous populations. So I think that we, um, the, the common thread there is that when we think about mental health issues and we think about substance abuse issues, we cannot ignore the context, the socio-historical, the everyday context, even the immediate proximal neighborhood environments and the implications of being in those environments for the decisions that boys and men make. So if I were to say anything, I would say that we need to lift that up a bit more. And there certainly um, needs to be more data collection um, from the populations you mentioned. I mean, we are, we are embarrassingly behind the eight ball because we have failed to measure appropriately the exposures, consequences, and outcomes for, for um, Native Americans, Alaskan uh, Native populations too, so. Is there any plan to provide training for educators in Maryland? So I'm, I'm an advocate for uh, providing training for every point of interface that where boys and men are. And I, at the same time, I recognize that our educators are tremendously overburdened um, and overtrained. And we, we ask a lot of our teachers and our educators. So I want to be mindful of that. But with that said, there is a movement um, you know, in the country, I think um, not necessarily a new movement, but a reinvigorated movement around trauma-informed pedagogy and trauma-informed training for teachers, for uh, police officers, for, you know, again, for every person that has a high touch with this population. And I think we do need more understanding, um, broad understanding of the ways in which mental health issues show up for boys and men relative to the ways they show up for girls and men. This gets back to the issues around diagnoses and why we perhaps see lower rates of depression but higher rates of suicidality. It could be, I mean, it's a complex, wicked problem, but it could be that what we're observing is the lack, the failure of our instruments to ask boys and men about their emotional lives in ways that would actually help us to have better early detection and early warning systems. So I think, yes, teachers, absolutely, but recognizing that you, we, we, we need everybody in the village to support this, this effort. Um, for training educators too, there's sort of two ways you can think about it. Um, you can train educators in recognizing like mental health signs and symptoms and making referrals, but you can also train them in like underlying evidence-based practices that mitigate the likelihood of later mental health conditions. Um, and I think both are, it's like a both and. Um, and for example, if anyone in the room is familiar with the good behavior game, um, yeah, some people are. So it's a really easy first grade intervention 
uh, the teachers love because it dramatically improves like sort of classroom behavior. Um, and it has been shown now over like following kids for 20 years to reduce like lov levels of suicidal ideation, uh, substance use initiation, depression, all sorts of stuff we really, really, really care about. So I'll just jump right in and say that I've been a big proponent, and there are um, movements for this that are happening around narrative disruption. I think we need, and, and, and I'm not talking just about your, your sort of run-of-the-mill public media campaign, social media campaign, but we actually need more um, constructive dialogue, public discourse around the issues that are, that um, uh, increased risk for mental health disparities. We need more public conversation, we need more truth telling, and we need to create, not, I would say safe spaces are okay, but we need brave spaces where youth especially and uh, um, can come and air out what's happening in their lives. I think we're not listening enough, um, you know, as a country to our youth, and we want them to be seen and not heard, and I think that's a problem, and because we know these issues start earlier in the life course. So I'd like to see more of a sort of all out, sort of on, at every level, public discussion airing out uh, um, of the issues that we're talking about today, and creating spaces where people can feel comfortable, safe, and sanctioned to be emotionally vulnerable. Well, thank you all for coming and staying with us um, this afternoon. Um, on behalf of the speakers and um, the staff at MHN and our congressional sponsors, we want to thank you for joining us. And then also, please let us know if you are interested in learning more about the Men's Health Caucus. Uh, if you invite your bosses to join us, um, you can come speak to me or to Taylor Hiddle of Congressman Mullen's office or Stephen Schultz of Congressman Payne Jr.'s office. Have a wonderful rest of the week.